Welcome to another episode of Mike Reads. Tonight we'll be continuing with our interim series on Ludwig von Mises's The Anti-Capitalistic Mentality with our final read, which is in Chapter 5, entitled, quote, quote unquote, Anti-Communism versus Capitalism. As I've mentioned throughout the course of this series, at the end of each read, we'll be doing an analysis and review of the read. So I'll put a, a timestamp in this video's description so you can jump straight to the analysis and review part of the video if that's how you'd like to go about things. As I also mentioned, this is an interim read, and that's partly because the book is kind of too short to be doing a proper full read in this series, <clears throat> and also because I'm using this interim series as a way to get your input. So let me know in the comments section what it is you'd like me to read next after we finish this interim series, and I would be happy to oblige. So with all that out of the way, let's get into tonight's fifth and final read in Ludwig von Mises's The Anti-Capitalistic Mentality, which is chapter five, quote unquote, anti-communism versus capitalism. In the universe, there is never and nowhere stability and immobility. Change and transformation are essential features of life. Each state of affairs is transient. Each age is an age of transition. In human life, there is never calm and repose. Life is a process, not a perseverance and status quo. Yet the human mind has always been deluded by the image of an unchangeable existence. The avowed aim of all utopian movements is to put an end to history and to establish a final and permanent calm. The psychological reasons for this tendency are obvious. Every change alters the external conditions of life and well-being and forces people to adjust themselves anew to the modification of their environments. It hurts vested interests and threatens traditional ways of production and consumption. It annoys all those who are intellectually inert and shrink from revising their modes of thinking. Conservatism is contrary to the very nature of human acting, but it has always been the cherished program of the many, of the inert who dully res resist every attempt to improve their own conditions, which the minority of the alert initiate. In employing the term reactionary, one mostly refers only to the aristocrats and priests who called their parties conservatism, conservative, excuse me. Yet the outstanding examples of the reactionary spirit were provided by other groups by the guilds of artisans blocking entrance into their fields to newcomers, by the farmers asking for tariff protection, subsidies, and quote-unquote parity prices, by the wage earners hostile to technological improvements and fostering feather bedding and similar practices. The vain arrogance of the literati and the bohemian artists dismisses the activities of the businessmen as unintellectual money-making. The truth is that the entrepreneurs and promoters display more intellectual faculties and intuition than the average writer and painter. The inferiority of many self-styled self -styled intellectuals manifests itself precisely in the fact that they fail to recognize what capacity and reasoning power are required to develop and to operate successfully a business enterprise. The emergence of a numerous class of such frivolous intellectuals is one of the least welcome phenomena of the age of modern capitalism. Their obtrusive stir repels discriminating people. They are a nuisance. It would not directly harm anybody if something would be done to curb their bustle or, even better, to wipe out entirely their cliques and coteries. However, freedom is indivisible. Every attempt to restrict the freedom of the decadent, troublesome literati and pseudo-artists would vest in the authorities the power to determine what is good and what is bad. It would socialize intellectual and artistic effort. It is questionable whether it would weed out the useless and objectionable persons, but it, it, would, but it is certain that it would put insurmountable obstacles in the way of creative genius. The powers that be do not like new ideas, new ways of thought, 
and new styles of art. They are opposed to any kind of innovation. Their supremacy would result in strict regimentation. It would bring about stagnation and decay. The moral corruption, the licentiousness, and the intellectual sterility of a class of lewd would-be authors and artists is the ransom mankind must pay lest the creative pioneers be prevented from accomplishing their work. Freedom must be granted to all, even to base people, lest the few who can use it for the benefit of mankind be hindered. The license which the shabby characters of the Quartier Latin enjoy was enjoyed, excuse me, was one of the conditions that made possible the ascendance of a few great writers, painters, and sculptors. The first thing a genius needs is to breathe free air. After all, it is not the frivolous doctrines of the Bohemians that generate disaster, but the fact that the public is ready to accept them favorably. The response to these pseudo-philosophies on the part of the molders of public opinion and later on the part of the misguided masses is the evil. People are anxious to endorse the tenets they consider as fashionable lest they appear boorish and backward. The most pernicious ideology of the last 60 years was George Sorrell's syndicalism and his enthusiasm for the action directe. Generated by a frustrated French intellectual, it soon captivated the literati of all European countries. It was a major factor in the radicalization of all subversive mo movements. It influenced French royalism, militarism, and anti-Semitism. It played an important role in the evolution of the Russian Bolshevism, Italian fascism, and the German youth movement, which finally resulted in the development of Nazism. It transformed political parties intent upon winning through electoral campaigns into factions which relied upon the organization of armed bands. It brought into discredit representative government and quote-unquote bourgeois security and preached the gospel both of civil and of foreign war. Its main slogan was violence and again violence. The present state of European affairs is to a great extent an outcome of the present prevalence of Sorrell's teachings. The intellectuals were the first to hail the ideas of Sorrell. They made them popular. But the tenor of Sorrellism was obviously anti-intellectual. He was opposed to cool reasoning and sober deliberation. What counts for Sorrell is solely the deed, vis-a-vis -vis the act of violence for the sake of violence. Fight for a myth, whatever this myth may mean, was his advice. Quote, If you place yourself on this ground of myths, you are proof against any kind of critical refutation. End quote. What a marvelous philosophy to destroy for the sake of destruction. Do not talk, do not reason, kill. Sorrel rejects the quote-unquote intellectual effort even of the literary champions of revolution. The essential aim of the myth is, quote, to prepare people to fight for the destruction of what exists, end quote. Yet the blame for the spread of the destructionist pseudo-philosophy rests neither with Sorrell nor with his disciples, Lenin, Mussolini, and Rosenberg, nor with the hosts of irresponsible literati and artists. The catastrophe came because, for many decades, hardly anybody ventured to examine critically and to explode the trigger consciousness of fanatical desperados. Even those authors who refrained from unreservedly endorsing the ideas of reckless violence were eager to find some sympathetic interpretation of the worst excesses of the, de of the dictators. The first timid objections were raised only when, very late indeed, the intellectual abettors of these policies began to realize that even enthusiastic endorsement of, total of the totalitarian ideology did not guarantee immunity from torture and execution. There exists today a sham anti-communist front. What these people who call themselves quote-unquote 
anti-communist liberals, and whom sober men more correctly call quote-unquote anti-communists, are aiming at is communism without those inherent and necessary features of communism which are still unpalatable to Americans. They make an illusory distinction between communism and socialism and, paradoxically enough, look for a support of their recommendation of non-communist socialism to the document which its authors called the Communist Manifesto. They think that they prove their case by employing such aliases for socialism as planning or the welfare state. They pretend to reject the revolutionary and dictatorial aspirations of the quote-unquote Reds, and at the same time they praise in books and magazines, in schools and universities, Karl Marx, the champion of the communist revolution and the dictatorship of the proletariat, as one of the greatest economists, philosophers, and sociologists, and as the eminent benefactor and liberator of mankind. They want to make us believe that untotalitarian totalitarianism, a kind of triangular square, is the patent medicine for all ills. Whenever they raise some mild objection to communism, they are eager to abuse capitalism in terms borrowed from the abjurgatory vocabulary of Marx and Lenin. They emphasize that they abhor capitalism much more passionately than communism, and they justify all the unsavory acts of the communists by referring to the quote-unquote unspeakable horrors of capitalism. In short, they pretend to fight communism in trying to convert people to the ideas of the Communist Manifesto. What these self-styled quote-unquote anti-communist liberals are fighting against is not communism as such, but a communist system in which they themselves are not at the helm. What they are aiming at is a socialist, i.e. communist, system in which they themselves, or their most intimate friends, hold the reins of government. It would perhaps be too much to say that they are burning with a desire to liquidate other people, They simply do not wish to be liquidated. In a socialist commonwealth, only the supreme autocrat and his abettors have this assurance. An quote-unquote anti-something movement displays a purely negative attitude. It has no chance whatsoever to succeed. Its passionate diatribes virtually advertise the program that they attack. People must fight for something that they want to achieve, not simply reject an evil, however bad it may be. They must, without any reservations, endorse the program program of the market economy. Communism would have today, after the disillusionment brought by the deeds of the Soviets and the lamentable failure of all socialist experiments, but little chance of succeeding in the West if it were not for this faked anti-communism. What alone can prevent the civilized nations of Western Europe, America, and Australia from being enslaved by by the barbarism of Moscow is open and unrestricted support of laissez-faire capitalism. That concludes tonight's read. Now on to the analysis and review part of the video. All right, welcome to the analysis and review part of the video. So as I've said throughout the course of this series, since this and now that this is the final read, this is your final opportunity to let me know in the comments section what it is you want me to read next, and I will be happy to oblige. Remember, this is probably the main reason I'm doing this series in the first place, and the reason it is being labeled as an interim series and not a proper you know, series like we've done before, is again, to collect that information. So this is your opportunity to let me know what it is you want me to read next, Put it down in the comment section. And then, with with that out of the way, this really wasn't very long of a read, so we're going to try to keep this review as short and sweet as possible. In this case, we're going to go through more of a review than a strict analysis because there isn't much to analyze in this in this read because of how short it is. <clears throat> but this is to review to begin the review. Of course, where this chapter reads much more like a speech than a conclusion in the way that, Sol, that say, somebody like Sol would write his uh, concluding and closing chapters. Uh, say, like out of, let me just pull this off the shelf. 
Uh, that is a pile of books we have here. Yeah, so we have Soul's Economic, we have Soul's Economic Facts and Fallacies, and the final chapter is, I believe, so, well, Summary and Implications is the final uh, part of each one of these chapters. Third World Facts and Fallacies, as we just went over in this series. I'll put a link in this video's description so you guys can, can uh, hop onto that series if, that's, if you'd like to. But the final chapter is Chapter 8, Parting Thoughts, and that is just a three or four, one, two, three, four, five page just conclusion to the entire read. Um, and that's kind of true of how a lot of these reads go. Uh, with, the wealth, with the Wealth of Nations, it's less the case, but again, this is a 250-year-old book, so the way that they did things back then was a little bit different from the way that they did things today. Um, I believe, what was the last chapter in Henry Hazlitt's Economics in one lesson, uh, besides the note on books? It was the lesson after 30 years. So yeah, he's basically summarizing what's happened over the course of the last 30 years and what's happened. Uh, the, the previous chapter for that is just the lesson restated. So again, he, this doesn't read like a conclusion. It reads like a speech. It reads like Ludwig von Mises has stepped up to the podium and is saying his, and is making his case, is building his argument in the first place. It sounds like, another argument is being introduced, in this case in the form of opinion, which I totally get, but it's not, it's not, it's not really a concluding chapter. It's more of just like another speech. Um, and this is the place, when you have a conclusion, when you have the closing chapter, when you have the closing read, this is the place to normally inject opinion, but it would have been better if the chapter concluded, I think, the thesis rather than expositing further thought. So, of course, the thesis is the anti-capitalistic mentality. It explains in the introduction, as we went over, that the whole thesis of this book is to explain where the anti-capitalistic mentality came from, why it permeates, and why it became popular. Um, now, that said, if it were just a standalone speech, it was kind of brilliant. So, honestly, this chapter could have just been the whole book. Uh, the whole book is only 67 pages long, and this chapter is only four pages long. I've, sp I've complained incessantly in my reviews in this book about how how, un how overly long some of these reads are, and how overly long-winded um, some of these reads are, and I've complained c constantly about his lack of concision and writing to the common reader. Um, so, honestly, like I said, Thomas Sowell could have done this 67-page book in probably 15, 20, and it would have been much easier to read, and it probably would have still made the point successfully. This is part of why I love Thomas Sowell. But in any case, I still love the read in, in terms of the actual content. It, I mean, it does a whole lot of, if you will, dunking on the left. And of course, there's a whole host of just, on pages 66 and 67 especially, we're, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole book is just, does this sound familiar for me? And we're getting just even more of it in this chapter. Uh, for, for example, the entire two, the final two pages are basically just about ant, the quote-unquote anti-communist astroturfing. Again, where have we seen this before? On page 66, quote, the illusory distinction, he talks about the, quote, the illusory distinction between socialism and communism. Huh, the left resorting to a distinction without a difference. Does this sound familiar? On page 67, quote, They want to make us believe that totalit untotalitarian totalitarianism, a kind of triangular square, end quote. Again, does any of this sound familiar? This is, this is the Marxian dialectic, the notion that a thing can simultaneously be itself and its antonym. Again, you have to destroy language for this to even be possible. Not just destroy English, not destroy Western languages, but destroy the notion of languages. That in communicating an idea, you have to communicate an idea. That there are bounds to an idea. The fact that an idea is an idea means that it has a limitation, that it is not another idea. And for if it, if it can mean another idea, then you are not describing language. You're not describing an ordered, codified uh, system of complex communication. That's not language at that point, right? <clears throat> I, I mean, and again, this is, this is just a... Com this, this line, they want to make us believe that untotalitarianism, untotalitarian totalitarianism, a kind of triangular square. No, 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 not, not Soviet-style communism, right? We want, we want the communism where I'm at the helm. We want this communism. They, we're not, 
real communism's never been tried. We constantly have to move the goalposts. Again, does this does any of this sound familiar? And again, what they want is just the communism where they are the dictator. Page 67, quote, what these self-styled anti-communist liberals are, so, excuse me, quote, what these self-styled quote-unquote anti-communist liberals are fighting against is not communism as such, but a communist system in which they themselves are not at the helm. Yeah. Does any of this sound familiar? And the only thing that Mises, and again, it's, it's I, part of why I find this read I decided to do this read is because it was written in 1956 and has been just utterly prophetic in certain ways about where the proverbial left and where the communists have gone and where the anti-capitalists have gone over the course of the last 60 some odd years since this book was last updated. And the only thing that Mises really gets wrong and he really gets this wrong are his predictions on how things will, will wind up unfolding in praxis. So, Mises basically intimates that this is this all of this stuff is so dumb that it will just eat itself out, right? It will just eat itself and disappear, and that's not true. That didn't happen at all. All of this stuff that he's saying are the reasons why this thing will go away are actually the things that have become mainstreamed. Right? Stalinism and Maoism are now in the out in the open and on the rise. It's, you know, it, it, Zoomers, if you will. When was the last time you saw an entire generation where it was not uncommon to see, a, you know, a poster of Chairman Mao, a flag of Chairman Mao, you know, a, someone creating some sort of totem towards Stalin himself, right? It's no longer, no, 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 not Soviet communism. In many places, it's becoming, yeah, no, screw it. We want Soviet communism. We, we, want, we want the Great Leap Forward from China. We want Maoism, right? And... It's now in the open and on the rise. The other thing that he gets wrong about his prediction is te revolution, right? Is the defining feature of an entire major political party. Violent uprising is one of the major, it's probably the defining feature of an entire major political party. In 2020, we had whole, I mean, he did get right that they would use an astroturfed shell game, right? In this case, anti-fascism parading around as something being oh no it just means it's just an idea it's not it's not real it's just an idea it's not out in the open it's not burning whole cities to the ground right it's not holding hostage entire city blocks in the chaz and the chop and declaring independent an entire sovereign nation within those six six blocks um, we again in 2020 we saw the burning down of whole cities, explicit calls for dismantling of the entire republican form of government, for Stalinism, and again what we just described the Chaz the Chapa, an actual insurrection. The point is that where Mises said that the revolutions, the the explicit calls for violence would wind up having to would wind up becoming the fringe, and having to be cast aside for less violent revolutionism. This has actually been mainstreamed. This has been explicitly endorsed by, for all intents and purposes, the totality of a major American political party. Mises said that they could, that things couldn't get to this point, and yet here we are. So on this matter, he got quite, he was pretty far off on his predictions. I'm guessing the reason he gets some of these predictions moving forward, which are significantly less important than the lessons being espoused in the actual thesis here. The predictions that he got wrong, I'm guessing he got wrong because this is really more of a manifesto than an essay. And the final line kind of makes it clear that, that what this is is a manifesto and not an essay. What alone can prevent the civilized nations of Western Europe, America, and Australia from being enslaved by the barbarism of Moscow is open and unrestricted support of laissez-faire capitalism. So let's, let's actually compare that to the closing line of Thomas Sowell's trickle-down theory and tax cuts for the rich, rich, in scare quotes. The final sentence of this is, Meanwhile, unemployed workers cannot get near... Let's read the entire finishing 
paragraph. To the extent that the American economy has changed since the time of Andrew Mellon, it has changed in ways that make it even easier for wealthy investors to escape high tax rates. A globalized economy makes overseas investments a readily available alternative to buying tax-exempt bonds domestically, even if the domestic tax rate is not quote-unquote high by historic standards. What matters now is whether it is high compared to tax rates in other countries to much to which large sums of money can be readily sent electronically. Meanwhile, unemployed workers cannot nearly so readily lo- relocate to other countries to take the jobs created there by American investments fleeing other tax rates at home. So in that statement, he's, he's making a descriptive claim that is implying a clear uh, prescription, a, p- a clear moral prescription, whereas in here, in, in Ludwig von Mises' closing line, it's just the moral prescription. It's just a, an explicit advocacy for a, for a particular economic policy. We can even go to F. A. Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, which, again, was not really a manifesto. It was really an incredibly long essay. I've described, link is in this video's description we, to my review of the book, which I loved. Here's a closing sentence to that. The guiding principle that a policy of freedom for the individual is the only truly progressive policy remains as true today as it was in the 19th century. So this is a statement towards truth. This is just a matter of this the, This thing is true. This statement is true. Instead, in, in, in the final, re, final sentence in uh, Ludwig von Mises' uh, The Anti-Capitalistic Mentality, what alone can prevent the civilized nations of Western Europe and Australia from being enslaved is the barbarism in, by the barbarism of Moscow is open and unrestricted support of laissez-faire capitalism. This is there's no way to derive a prescription from what is well. There's no way to not have that be an explicit prescription of in terms of pl- philosophy. So it reads it, the final sentence kind of makes it clear that what this is is a manifesto. And though it reads like a manifesto, it's really not that one. In fact, it's pretty darn good. But as far as my review of the book as a whole, we'll have to leave that for another another, another day. Uh, and more on that in my review, which will be coming up very shortly. Stay tuned for that. So thanks to everyone who has st- stuck with me throughout the course of this series. Again, please do let me know in the comment section what it is you'd like for me to read next. That's really what I'm here for, is to get your input and to respond accordingly. So again, thanks to all my readers, to, to all the people who have stayed with me through all this. Thanks to all the fans. We'll see you in the next one. Good night, folks.